Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. Today we're going to talk about a couple things, but the main thing I want to talk about is what I call the 7% solution. What do I mean by the 7% solution? It means that if you're taking chess lessons, you probably are going to learn 93% of what you're going to learn during the chess lesson session time, not the session time, but the time, the time period when you're taking the lessons you're going to learn about 93% of what you're doing during the stuff you're doing in between the lessons rather than during the lessons. What do I mean by that? Well, during the lesson you have one hour, and let's say you're taking a lesson every two weeks. There's 168 hours in a week, so that's 336 hours in two weeks. So there's 335 other hours where you can learn stuff in between the lessons. And hopefully if you have a good instructor, he'll have you doing the right things. What can an instructor do to help you in between the lessons? Well, he can help you, for instance, find who to play. You know, rather than hitting buttons on the internet, you should set up games against people that you know, people that will review the games with you, people that won't log off when they're losing, people that will play the time controls that you want. Speaking of time controls, your instructor can help you with time controls. They can teach you about trying to avoid playing a lot of intermediate time controls so that you learn how to think. I just read an article on the March Chess Life about that. He called it, you know, System 1 versus System 2 thinking, where System 1 thinking is the kind of thing where you think in fast games where you're very superficial. System 2 thinking is the kind of thinking you need to get to be a good player. And he was talking about the, the fact that you need to play these slow games to learn how to think or do very difficult puzzles where you take a long time. So learning how to think is an important part of chess. And when you're taking a lesson, your, your instructor can give you knowledge, he can teach you openings, he can teach you end games, he can get, help you with your skills, he can teach you how to analyze better, how to evaluate better. We want to teach you skills and not just give you a bunch of knowledge during the lesson, that's very important. But in between the lessons he can have you doing things like I read a, a couple thousand annotated games the first three years I played and I got from unrated up to USCF expert. So your instructor can tell you, man, and when you read these things, these instructive anthology games like Logical Chess Move by Move or my book, The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book, then you're going to learn a tremendous amount about openings, middle games, end games, strategy, tactics, time management, all those things that you need to know to become a good player. You can get those in between the lessons when you're reading a lot of these games. Or when you're doing puzzles, you can learn patterns. You can learn tactical patterns. You can learn end game patterns. You can go over your game with your opponent and learn what they were thinking and what they could have done or why they didn't do things. You can go over the game with an engine and learn, you know, what did I miss and what's, what's good about what I missed and what's bad about what I missed and how can I learn from what I missed. You can look up your openings in a database. You can look up your openings with an engine or a book, a video. These are all things you do in between the lessons that make me think that if you're doing the right things and you're, and you're following the, the, the way that you should be doing, playing the right people, doing the right things, reading the right books, don't reading books that are way above your level, which are going to make you think about the wrong things. If your rating's well below 1,700, you shouldn't be reading My 60 Memorable Games. You know, those aren't the kind of books that are going to get you better. If your instructor's helping you learn these things, then 93% of what you're learning is in between. Let's take in a couple examples here from... A student's recent games. Here's an end game position for one of my students' games. And first, let's show you how the end game went. And then let's show you how much the student could have learned from this end game. In the end game, it was uh, White's move. And White played his natural move, King takes d4. And Black now can't go after the h pawn because all the squares there are guarded. And of course, if he goes King g3, the pawn just goes in and gets a queen. So Black took the pawn. White pushed the pawn. Black says, I got to get away, get out of the way of my pawn so I can race with him. He's a little ahead in the race. Maybe I'll attack his pawn. He immediately played king here. All these moves, both sides had a lot of time, and these moves were played very, very quickly. Okay, king g4, h6, f4, h7, f3, h8, queen, f2, white played... Queen h1, a good move, getting ready to go to sleep in the endgame with queen f1. King to g3, and white says, I don't even need queen f1 anymore. I'll just play king e3, and black resigned. 
because he's in Zugzwang, he has to lose the pawn. Okay, well that may look like a very reasonable endgame, but what you could learn in between, and you don't need your instructor to do this, the engine will tell you on every move what's happening. Let's go back to the start before king d4. So king d4 looks like the obvious move. What else could white play? If he plays h5, then black will play king g5 and just win the pawn. And all the other king moves move away from the pawn. It just doesn't make sense. So you would think white could fairly quickly play king takes d4 here. But actually, king takes d4 is a massive blunder, believe it or not, even though it looks like the obvious move. If we turn on the engine, we ask him to show us the top three moves. White only has two winning moves, and both winning moves are to move away from the pawn. Taking the pawn is a draw. So let's turn off the engine and show you why taking the pawn should be a draw. Take the pawn. As we said, black can't go after the pawn. He has to take the pawn. And now white plays here, but now black moving away from the queening square is the wrong idea. Black also can't move toward his queening square because he'll just lose the pawn. If king to g2, then king to e5, and black can resign. So the right move for black here is to play f4. And now white may as well get a queen, but now black is going to have a bishop pawn against a queen, and if he can get to the seventh rank, and it's, the white king is sufficiently far away, he gets the draw. For instance, in this position, check here, that's the right square, threatening to get a queen. Check here, check here. If you've never seen this before, go back and watch my video, queen against pawn on the seventh rank. King h2, queen f3, that's the key move. It's not a check but we're threatening to take the pawn, and he's got to guard it, and he guards it, and now you check, and if he goes in front of the pawn, you bring the king up and you win. But here, because it's a bishop pawn, which is, you know, one of those special pawns against the queen on the seventh rank, you can go in the corner, and white can't take the pawn, because it's stalemate. So queen takes f2 is stalemate, and if he tries to bring the king closer, black will just get a queen, and if he keeps checking, then... There'll be no progress here. Black's threatening to get a queen, and this position is a draw. So if we go back to the starting position, let's see if we can do that. King takes, king takes, pawn up, pawn up. Only move to draw is pawn up, pawn here, and now king here. Pawn up, pawn up, pawn up. Pawn here, and this is a theoretical draw. Okay, so king takes d4 is a draw, but why would any other move be better? Well, let's take a look. It turns out you could play king d2 or king e2. Let's look at king d2, because king e2 looks more logical. Well, you know, if you're going to not take the pawn, why not guard your own pawn? Let's say white goes king to d2. Well, again, black can't go to the right. He can't, he can't catch the h-pawn here, but he's in Sugsvang. If he goes back, well, let's take the pawn first. Let's say he takes the pawn now. This is a little different because the white, the white king is a little closer to where he's queening. So pawn here, pawn here, pawn up. We'll turn on the engine just to show you. Same idea as before, king here, pawn here, pawn here, pawn queens, pawn here. And you might say, well, isn't this the same as before except black's better because he has a pawn on d4. But the pawn on d4 prevents him from getting a stalemate. King, queen here. Again, if he keeps going in front, then you can just bring your queen closer. And in fact, he'll, he'll run out of moves very quickly. So the, the engine says king f3, queen check. We're just going to zigzag our queen closer. Queen check. You never usually want to go to f3, but here it doesn't matter because... Black's lost, king here, queen check, king here, and now the king can come over and take the pawn and wins. If there's a check here, you just go in front. If he keeps going, you take check, and then you take the pawn and you win. Let's say he does something else. Let's say after queen checks, he had played this king move here. Then already white can play king here, or he can bring the queen closer It'll win, these moves will win anyway. Here, 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 
here, here, here, here. And now if you go in front like this, then white's just going to put you in Sugsvang and then checkmate you. If you go in the corner, like in the other line, then queen takes pawn is not stalemate because black has the move. And when he goes there, we just move the queen away, take the pawn, come back and mate him, and it's, there's no stalemate. All right, let's go back to the start again. So after king to d2, we see that king takes f3 is actually doesn't work because it's not stalemate. So let's say black says, all right, I understand that. I'll just go back and stop your pawn now. All right, so why is white winning here? Well, white could repeat the position and then change the position. But the engine says, oh, we could also play a move like king to e2 now. And now if he plays king to f4, trying to repeat, white can play king to d3, triangulating. And now if black goes back, king back, white can play even h5. And if the king goes after the pawn, white can take the pawn. If black goes after the pawn with king g5, king e5, if he takes, we take. And we have our king two squares in front of a non-rook pawn, which is a win. But what else can he do? He has no moves to guard the pawn if he pushes the pawn. White has winning ideas. He can either wait or he can push. Either way, he's going to win. Let's say he pushes, black takes, white takes, black tries to come back, and white gets two ranks in front of the pawn again. Has the op Well, he can get the opposition, and he's winning this position. Not easy, but he is winning. So king e2, same idea if he plays king e5. You can triangulate with king to d2. Obviously, you can play king d3, but that would get us back to the same position as before. King d2, king f4, and now king d3. And we've reached the same original position, but with black to move. And we just saw that going back really doesn't work. King to e5. White has a couple of winning moves. He could even play king to c4, believe it or not. But we just showed how he could win with h5. But if black go, doesn't go back, if, if white plays king d3 and black takes the pawn, now, there's, now there is stalemates, but because the white king is so close, he's still winning. Let's look at that. h5, f4, h6, king g2, h7, f3, h8, queen, pawn here. And now we should zigzag closer again. Check here. Check here, check here, check here, check here. And now again, we've got this no stalemate idea. White can just bring the king over. In, in lines where his king was up here, he can never bring the king here because the pawn will queen. But when he's on the third rank, the king can perform the function of stopping the pawn from queening. And now he's just threatening king takes pawn followed by mate. And there's no defense against that. D3 check, king here, pawn here. Well, let's play queen h5 checkmate. Okay, now I told my student, I said, you know, you can go over this game with the engine, you don't need me to look at this end game. And I said, uh, when you're doing that, you can play what if games with the engine and say, you know, Mr. Engine, king e2, king d2, well, why doesn't my move king d4 win? You could play out your game and find out why your move doesn't win. Right here, the engine is telling you king d4 is 0, 0, 0. And you could say, well, let me go through all the lines with king e2 and see if I can understand what's going on. If I can't understand, then I'll ask Dan in our next lesson. Hey, Dan, this end game, the computer said going back was a win and taking the pawn was a was a draw, and I don't understand why I went over with him, but I really couldn't get what he was trying to tell me. Well, then that's where your instructor can do his 7%. The 7% solution comes in when the instructor can try to explain what's happening here. Now, I told my student, I said, if I was playing a speed game here, I probably would play king takes d4, and if my opponent was a good, strong master too, he would probably get his draw. Uh, 
But if I was playing a slow game and I had the kind of time that, that these guys had on the clock, which is, you know, lots and lots of time, well, I might not play this move for like 10 minutes trying to figure everything out. I would probably figure out that king takes d4 is a draw. And then I would start thinking, well, maybe I should play something like king to e2. And I would try to figure that out too and figure out if that gives me better chances. I wouldn't just play the obvious move. This gets back to Fide Master uh, Solon's article about system one versus system two thinking. Your system one thinking tells you king takes d4 is the only move. It's the only move that makes sense. You're, if you save the, the f3 pawn, what's the point? He, you could win a pawn first, and if he takes your pawn, you can get a queen. That's your system one thinking. Your system two thinking is, let me learn how to analyze. Let me look deeper and figure out if king d4 actually does win, which it doesn't. And then my system two thinking is going to say, well, if king takes d4 doesn't win, maybe the less likely looking move, king e2, is actually the move that would win. So this is the kind of thing you get from playing slow games slowly. Now, it doesn't do you any good to do what these guys did, which is to play a slow game quickly. You know, if you, if you make a move like this really quickly because king takes d4 is, quote, the obvious move, then you're playing like people who are under 1700 usually play. That's, that's what they do. They just say, oh, well, uh, king takes d4 is the obvious move. I'll just play it. That's not the way you become a good endgame player. And it's not that you need to buy Silman's endgame book and, you know, look up in Silman's endgame book and you know, how to play all these different exact endgames because you're not going to find this position in the book. You have to learn to do two things. Take your time and analyze carefully. If you don't take your time, it doesn't matter. If you use system one thinking as... They said in the March 2022 Chess Life article, then you're just going to take the pawn quickly and see what happens. But that's not how good players play. Good players play slow games with what he calls system two thinking. It's the same thing I've been saying all along about playing quickly, playing superficially, learning how to play long games and thinking, avoiding playing hope chess, avoiding, for instance, when you're trying to see if a move is safe, if you're using just system one, then you just look at the board and say, oh, that looks safe, I don't see any danger, and you make the move. If you're using system two thinking, then you're thinking, oh, well, that may, move, may look safe, I don't see any danger, but let's look at his dangerous checks, captures, and threats and make sure I can meet every single one of them. And this, this position is a really, really good example of that. It's not an ex example of the tactics per se, but it's an example of, the obvious move is just turns out to be the wrong move. And I, I, I thank my student for showing me this game because th it's such a good position to show people, you know, how superficial thinking can be so wrong. And it's not obvious sometimes in endgame positions what the right ideas are, even though some ideas look obvious to lower rated players. Once you see enough puzzles like this, you start to think, oh, Maybe, maybe the obvious move isn't the right move. Maybe I should think about this a little bit. And, of course, that's a big, big, big lesson to learn. Let's take a look at another uh, something had to happen in a student game. Okay. My student was black in this position at the World Open this year. And he was up a pawn, and he said, Hmm, Dan said to me, when I'm winning, I should make fair trades of pieces. Maybe I can trade my bishop for his bishop to get rid of that nice battery he has on the b1 to h7 diagonal. And I could pin his bishop to his queen, and I can trade off the bishops, and I'll get closer to an endgame where I'm up a pawn. So he looked at the, at the candidate move, bishop e4. So I asked the viewers of the video, is bishop to e4 safe? You can pause the video and try to figure it out. Is bishop to e4 safe? We'll turn off the engine here. We'd don't want you getting engine help. Not that the, en the engine th won't tell you there because it doesn't look at all the modes, but I'll turn it off anyway. All right, so is bishop to e4 safe? Okay, if you pause the video, you can come back. All right, so there's a couple ideas going on here. The first idea is how many times is white attacking that bishop and how many times is it guarded? Well, one of the keys to the position is the knight on c3 is pinned to the king. And since the knight on c3 is pinned to the king, if you play bishop e4, then knight takes e4 is illegal. So you might think, well, that knight is not really attacking the bishop. So you might think in terms of, well, maybe you could pin the bishop by putting a rook on e1. All right, so let's take a look at some of the ideas here. And again, this gets back to what you could learn. Oh, we got to make it black smooth. All right, Mr. Board Editor. Uh, let's see here. Board Editor... 
black to play. I guess that will help. Study YouTube channel. There it is. Let's. Oh, I guess we should flip the board. Board editor. <laughs> Same thing. Set the set the board. Uh, white to play. Let's see. Does it have the orientation here? Black to play. I don't see the orientation button. All right. We'll learn. All right. Set it up. All right. So anyway, we're looking at bishop to e4. That move. All right, let's play the move, bishop e4. Let's put a rook on d1 and see if that works. Rook to d1, now that bishop is attacked by the bishop, indirectly by the queen on c2, by the rook, and the bishop can't move without losing the queen. But the bishop has a move where he can attack white's queen. All he has to do is play bishop takes d3. Well, if the rook takes the queen, bishop takes, king takes, and we've managed to trade a bishop and a queen for a bishop and a queen, and black's still up a pawn in the endgame. So that actually works. If black plays bishop takes d3 and white plays queen takes d3, then black can move the queen somewhere, like maybe queen to c7. And even though white's got some attack here, black's still up a pawn, and black has not lost the bishop. So after bishop e4, the idea of pinning it with rook to d1, doesn't matter which rook it is, fails to bishop takes d3. But what this really is, is a counting problem. And the counting problem is all involved with that knight that's pinned. And what happens is if you take the bishop and black takes with the queen, well, then the knight can take the queen because the knight's not pinned anymore. So you have to take the bishop with the knight. And now you can take the, bit, the knight with the queen. And there's the problem for black. His queen is overworked. His queen is pinning the knight. So you might say, well, that knight's not really guarding the queen, but it really is guarding the queen because the piece that's going to take the queen is the piece that's pinning the knight. And when you move the queen, the knight is no longer pinned and the knight can take, which means in this puzzle, bishop e4, it's not safe because even though right now it's only attacked two times and it's guarded two times, once the second guard recaptures, that activates the third attacking piece on the square and white wins a piece. So after bishop takes e4, knight takes e4, queen takes e4, queen takes e4. And we've got knight takes e4 and white ends up winning a piece. So therefore, bishop e4 is not safe. Now, when I was going over the game with my student and I saw him play bishop e4, I basically within one second, I said, you can't do that, that's not safe. And my student says, yeah, I know, I went over the game with the computer and I was shocked that he told me after the game that that move just loses the bishop. And I, I went through with him in slow motion instant replay, you know, that this is again part of the 7% solution. He did the 93%, which is to learn that the bishop move wasn't safe. He also understood why, but, but I augmented why it wasn't safe. I talked about the fact that yes, just because this knight is pinned and he can't take the bishop, doesn't mean the knight can't maybe become free during the, the process of all the trades. And therefore you have to be careful about just not counting the knight as a guard on the bishop e4. What's also interesting is my student was playing a player who got off to a very good start in the World Open. So his opponent was a, a higher rated player than him. And his opponent made the exact same mistake. His opponent also didn't see that he was just winning the bishop by just capturing it, and his opponent did not capture the bishop, did not win the piece, even though his opponent was a much higher rated player. Bishop takes, knight takes, queen takes, queen takes, thank you for your bishop, and we win the game. All right, so these kind of things you want to do over and over again to train your eye to see how can I count better? How can I make sure the counting sequence is exactly going the way that I think it is? Because it only takes one bad move to lose a game. And this is an example of that move that loses the game. It's not so much that the bishop can be pinned with by a rook. And that may be, you know, all you need is to pin the bishop with a rook. In this case, it doesn't work. But bishop e4, a very, very, very dangerous move. It's moving to a square that's, a, that's a guarded multiple times. It's moving to a square that where the bishop could be pinned to the queen. There's all kinds of ways 
the white could, tr in fact, white could even try to think about a move like g5 to remove the guard and hit the knight. So there's all kinds of danger, a big sign being held up by, you know, the person watching the game saying, danger, 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 danger. If you play bishop e4, you better be awfully, awfully, awfully careful to make sure that that move really works because he's got bishop takes e4 that might win the knight, rook to f e1, sorry, rook to e1, rook g e1, g5. He's got all kinds of ideas to try to win the bishop on e4. And if even one of them works, then you're losing the bishop. And it turns out the easiest one works, which is bishop e4. All right, so we've looked at a middle game tactical situation, which isn't that difficult, but enough that both, both the player making the move and the player trying to refute it both made a mistake and didn't see that the move was unsafe. We've looked at a very complex and crazy in-game position where the obvious, you know, move that everybody would play if they had to play fast is just wrong and you want to do something else and what you learn from that is obvious moves aren't always the right moves this is back to my whole idea of the video which is the seven percent solution during the lesson i might give you an epiphany i might say something you never knew like oh don't play hope chess if you make a move don't wait to see what your opponent does and then if he makes a check capture or threat hope you can meet it Say to yourself, if I make this move, what are his dangerous checks, captures, and threats? And what would I do next move to meet them? And make sure you can, because if you make a move and then someone set, makes a move against you and he makes a threat and there's no answer to it, then you could be Magnus Carlsen or Stockfish 15. It doesn't matter. You're just going to lose because it's an unstoppable threat. And in chess, unstoppable threats are relatively easy to make if you're, if, if you're not paying attention and you're not checking to see whether or not the, the checks, captures, and threats he could make on the next move might be stoppable or not. So that might be an epiphany for you. And maybe as an epiphany, the 7% is something you desperately need and you would be stuck forever if you're not getting that feedback from your instructor. But if you're doing the right things, you're playing the right people, you're going over the games with them, you're looking up your openings, you're going through instructive anthologies, you're doing repetitious, easy puzzles over and over again. You're doing all those things. You're playing the right people. You're playing as many tournaments as you can. You're not worrying about your rating. All those things that are happening in between the lessons, if you're doing all that stuff right and your instructor's job during that 7% is to make sure the 93% is as good as it possibly can be. If you eliminate the 7% and don't get that feedback, and try to do the 93% as 100% of what you're doing. You just try to study alone with no help from anybody. You'll get into bad habits. You'll get into misconceptions. You need that feedback that 7% may be a lot less than a 93%, but the 7% is really key toward getting better. And that's what you want to do. You want to get better. 93% of what you're going to learn is in between the lessons, but you've got that very, very valuable 7% where we can give epiphanies. We can dis do discussions. We can clear up misconceptions we can help you figure out that what you should be doing with your 93 percent that's really what we're good for the chess instructors okay hope you enjoyed today's video and if you haven't told everybody about my channel thanks for helping us get up to 5,000 followers or subscribers and we'll see you next time bye